Halo is one of those franchises that I grew up with. Alongside Gears of War, it was one of my first console games. But around 2012, Call of Duty stole the thunder with Black Ops 2, and I forgot about both of them until recently when I kind of fell out with that franchise as it just wasn't going in a direction I cared to follow anymore. But then came the announcement of Halo Infinite, and that instantly reignited the spark. I usually take the piss out of the overreactionary crowd, but when I saw Chief's classic helmet and that old, iconic Marty music played, I might have screamed a little bit. To all of you who screamed like absolute goofballs at the PPSH and the Gorod trailer, I get it now. Now, before we get started, there's a few things I'd like to get out of the way. Most important being to credit somebody who helped out with this project, Late Night Gaming. We actually talked about this game at length over Discord, and he helped clear up a few things that I wasn't so certain about. Plus, he was the one who actually gave me the final push to even move forward with this project. So, if you want to thank or blame someone, he's your guy. His channel will be down in the description if you want to go check it out. I know that I could easily put this at the end of the video, but let's be honest. Many viewers don't even make it to the end of short videos, much less TV length reviews. Second, I'm coming at this game from a much more casual perspective. I'm not someone who has played each entry for thousands of hours, read every book, or kept up with the community for years. Additionally, I'm not particularly biased in favor of 343 or Bungie. It's kind of like Call of Duty, where if I enjoy the game, I couldn't care less about what studio it came from. And lastly, these are just my thoughts on the game. I'm not trying to tell you I'm right and you're wrong or anything stupid like that. Those kinds of videos are just silly. So, with all that out of the way, let's get right into Halo 4. As is tradition, let's start with the positives first. And where better to start than the most important element of the entire campaign, the relationship between Chief and Cortana. This entire game's success is predicated on this element working, so it's good that this is something I feel is incredibly well done. The story starts out subtly enough, with Cortana's voice glitching out and distorting the suit's overlays just a little bit, but Chief quickly picks up on this and coaxes the truth out of her after crash landing on Requiem to which she reveals that she's suffering from rampancy, which is essentially the AI version of dementia. This similarity isn't just something I'm looking far too deep into, as I'm admittedly known to do on occasion. Josh Holmes actually talked about this very thing during a GDC talk in 2013. At the beginning of Halo 4, my, my mother was diagnosed with dementia, and you know, over the course of the production of the game, I, I watched her deteriorate as a human being and become someone that I, I couldn't even recognize. And, uh, you know, that was really hard, but it was also an inspiration to me to want to tell Cortana's story. Throughout the game, she continues to degrade, with the aforementioned auditory and visual glitches increasing in frequency. She loses control of herself on more than one occasion and needs Chief's intervention to help bring her back. That last detail is something I really appreciate about this game in comparison to the others. It's not all just on Cortana's shoulders this time around. Chief is an equally supportive force in this relationship, and they both try to pick one another up in times of need. It's a relatable, heartfelt story grounded by a very real fear, and is easily the most potent part of the game's narrative. Because of this, when people simply shrug this arc off as a forced love story, I can't help but raise an eyebrow. Like, I never got the impression that this was supposed to be taken as a romance between the two. It feels much more like a story of an emotionally stunted child losing a parent. There's a lot of moments throughout the game to support this where Cortana doesn't really speak to Chief like a normal person. She often needs to spell things out for him like an adult explaining the scarier parts of the world to a child. The most obvious example of this is during the mammoth ride in Reclaimer. Chief, do you even understand what rampancy is? Really? We don't just shut down. Our cognitive processes begin dividing exponentially according to our total knowledge base. We literally think ourselves to death. But even better is the scene after the composition of the staff of the Ivanov Research Station, where Cortana flat out explains to Chief that even if they reach Halsey and have her reconstructed, it won't be the same Cortana he's grown close to. It won't be me. You know that, right? Now, none of this would mean anything if they dropped the ball at the last moment, but thankfully, the ending of their story is genuinely touching. After Chief detonates the Havoc nuke and destroys the Mantle's approach, the two are able to share one last moment inside a hard light shield as Cortana comforts Chief before finally disappearing. 
There are so many things to love about this scene. The score is fantastic, and I love how its beginning is blended in with the sounds of Cortana appearing to Chief. This is the only scene in the game where Chief's armor doesn't sound like a walking tank, and this may subtly influence the viewer into seeing him as a gentler figure. You might not have noticed it, but your brain did. The performances are so damn good. You can hear the Chief breaking as he tries to keep his calm, collected persona he's had throughout the games. And Cortana feels like a genuinely warm and caring presence. The dialogue is very minimal, and what's there actually feels natural. I really like the callback to Halo Legends, with Cortana finally being able to touch Chief. The not-so-subtle imagery of Chief's world falling apart around him being reflected by the collapsing hard light shield. But what I find interesting about this shot is that he doesn't immediately react to it. He's stuck in the moment trying to come to terms with losing his closest friend. Now as much as I love this part of the game's narrative, I'd be remiss in mentioning the critiques lobbied against it. Primary being that with the context of the character's appearance in the original trilogy, it feels a bit sudden for the Chief to be this close to Cortana. And to be honest, I agree. It's a completely valid critique, and in a perfect world, I would have liked there to have been just a wee bit more time spent on smoothly transitioning the characters to this point. It doesn't change the fact that I love what's here though. You can love something while admitting its faults after all. Moving on, the voice acting is at a franchise high here. There is not a single weak performer in the entire cast. Steve Downs is given much more to work with this time around, and brings a lot of subtle nuance to the Chief. But the real star of the show is Jen Taylor as Cortana. I'll say right out of the gate though that I might be a bit biased, as she's always been one of my favorite characters in the series next to Johnson and Halo 2's portrayal of the Arbiter. She still has that sarcastic wit that we all know and love, but absolutely nails the quieter, more sincere scenes, especially towards the game's climax. If I had to say one bad thing about the cast, is that there's a handful of odd deliveries here and there, but nothing too distracting. Assisting the performances is the equally strong performance capture. In IGCs, the facial capture syncs up surprisingly well and still holds up to this day. What's especially impressive though, is just how good the eye tracking is. Many games get the lip syncing down, but forget to have the eyes dart around properly. When talking to someone, most people's eyes don't just stay focused on a single thing, unless you're an antisocial weirdo like myself. The only thing that takes me out of it a little bit is that the materials on the eyes themselves are a bit weird, especially on Lasky. I can't 100% pin it down, but the whites of his eyes just look a bit too bright for his face and stick out. Now world building wise, everything here feels like a natural evolution of where Halo 3 left off, to a casual like me at least. It makes complete sense for Oni and the UNSC to replace the Master Chief with a new generation of Spartans. But this time, without the controversy of child kidnappings and essentially breeding sociopathic war machines. It feels right to explore the Forerunners a bit more now that the Flood is gone, but of all the new lore bits introduced in Halo 4, my favorite is the introduction of Jewel Emdama's Covenant. Rather than simply have the old Covenant come back for no real reason, we get a side sect of religious fanatics that worship the Didact and his Prometheans. I feel like this was a great way to keep the familiar enemies in the game's sandbox, while at the same time keeping continuity with the lore. While there isn't that much on them beyond this in the game's main campaign, they actually feature quite heavily in Spartan Ops, led by the best villain since Halo 2's Prophet of Truth. It'd be a damn shame if they did nothing with the character in the next game, the game's visuals and cinematography. Setting aside whatever art gripes I may have, this is a beautiful looking game with absolutely phenomenal visual presentation and pacing. From the reveal of the Covenant fleet in Dawn, to the discovery of the Forerunner structures on Requiem, you could tell whoever was in charge of pacing knew exactly what they were doing. This is something Halo has always excelled at. Even if the script was a bit lacking or the emotional scenes just weren't landing, the visual presentation has always been there to boost it significantly. Even the librarian scene, for as poorly written as it is, is still visually interesting. While we're on the topic of art, I'd like to discuss Chief's new armor. Now this might be a little bit spicy, but I actually prefer this armor to the original. Primarily because of how the cinematic directors utilize its design to convey emotion in cutscenes and emphasize a generational difference. Many key shots take advantage of the way the visor looks from a different angle. A good example of this is when Chief and Cortana crash land on Requiem. In this shot, when Chief coaxes the truth out of Cortana, his helmet resembles a slightly furrowed brow and conveys a stern attitude. 
whereas when he puts it together that she's dying. The shot is focused in a way where his helmet's expression more resembles a look of concern or panic. There's little moments like this throughout the entire campaign, but the strongest use of his armor is in the game's climax. After Cortana fades away, Chief's shoulders are slumped down and his helmet is tilted up ever so slightly. His pose and the way this shot was photographed makes him seem so small and helpless. It's my headcanon that his shoulder armor was designed like this just to get this shot because it is so perfect. As for the generational difference, this one is a bit more obvious. Compared to the Spartan 4s, Chief looks like a relic from a different time. His armor is more rugged, bulky, and significantly less sleek than that of the newer Spartans. He's also much taller than them, especially in the outro cutscene where he towers above everyone on board the Infinity. The sound design for his armor also helps out significantly. In this game, and even in Halo 5, but to a much less successful extent, Chief doesn't just look like a walking tank, he sounds like one, which is something I never really felt in any of the prior games. Which brings me to the game's sound design, particularly that of the weapons. While it is jarring to have nothing sound like it used to, especially when the game is a direct sequel and not a spin-off title, I can't deny how much I love the sounds of most weapons in this game. They have a distinct punch that many of the Bungie-era weapons lacked. Just take a listen. Now, this isn't to say that I love all of the sounds. Of course, there are some that I feel just don't compare, such as the beam rifle, and the rocket launcher. But the worst offender is easily the battle rifle. Aside from the sounds of returning weapons, there's plenty of new weapons introduced in Halo 4. This is where I feel the sound design really disappoints. The storm rifle is lackluster enough, but most of the common Promethean weapons lack the raw punch of the UNSC and Old Covenant weapons. It's not all bad news though. The incineration cannon, binary rifle, and charge bolt shot sound really great. But aside from the bolt shot, these weapons don't appear all that often, so you're just going to be stuck with the suppressor and the light rifle, which don't really have a satisfying oomph to them. Now it's time to go over the little things that, while they may not be major enough to warrant their own segment, do help make the game just a little bit better in my eyes, and deserve mention. Every time Cortana glitches out, or causes the player's HUD to mess up, the game doesn't slow your movement speed. You have to be the one to slow the game down for a moment and listen to her if you're drawn in. The pacing is completely up to you. I'll admit, I found myself stopping on more than one occasion. This is a much welcome change from Halo 3 where the Chief's visions of Cortana and the Gravemind cause you to slow down to a crawl until it was over, which could get really annoying later on in the game, especially in the mission Cortana. Yikes. The sticky detonator in general. In the actual campaign, it only shows up once or twice, but is so much fun to use. Just shoot it next to a barrel or some other explosive and wait until just the right moment to detonate. There aren't that many 343 era weapons I'd like to see return in Halo Infinite, but I would be kind of heartbroken if Halo 4 was the last time we saw this weapon. The choice to not score the aftermath of Ivanov Station's composing. Cutting the music out isn't something that always works, but when used sparingly, it's one of those things that hits my sweet spot just right. I love that Jewel Amdama's Covenant speaks in a dead language. It helps differentiate them from the Covenant of old. Plus, I don't think having grunts running around screaming about Flip Yap and the Fist of Rucked really would have fit the game's darker tone all that well. It'd be like having the Elite screaming wart 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 as they eviscerated Noble Six. Funny? Yes. Fitting? Eh, not so much. The pacing of the Broadsword Trench Run. From the game's music, dialogue, and visuals, everything here synergizes perfectly to form one of the most well-paced and satisfying sequences in the entire game. I also can't help but love just how much of a Master Chief fanboy Lasky actually is. We promised to get the Chief inside that ship, and I'm not about to let that man down! The game's moments of action movie cheese. Despite the much more grim and grounded tone of certain aspects of the story, there's still the occasionally cheesy moment. Now what do we do? Plan B. 
It's so silly, but so good. I never thought I'd live to see the day where Master Chief did a Vitruvian Man imitation. And lastly, this objective marker in the final mission. This is the only time in the entire game where it's not a generic mission pop-up. I know it's supposed to be comforting and reassuring to Chief, but combined with the whispers of Cortana's rampant personalities and the game's score, I find it really unsettling. Now we move on to what I feel just did not work. And sadly, I feel that the biggest issue with the campaign is the gameplay itself. There's so many little issues that stack on each other to create a, at times, rather frustrating experience. Starting with the most obvious change, the artificial intelligence. Not Cortana, but the enemy AI. Good joke, me. In Halo 4, all NPCs have been significantly downgraded from previous entries. They don't track the player as well. Even on higher difficulties, they walk out in the open constantly, and you can break any enemy's interest in you by simply crouching behind a piece of cover. These changes are made all the more noticeable when the game is played in close proximity to what I feel was the series' high point for AI, Halo Reach. In Reach, the Elites, especially Elite Ultras, were a force to be reckoned with and would absolutely ruin your day if you made a wrong move. In Halo 4 though, Elites will throw the occasional sticky grenade and hop from side to side, but that's about it. All weapons, especially UNSC weapons, have far too little ammo. In previous games, especially 3 and Reach, you could often keep your UNSC loadout throughout most of the level due to very high starting ammo and well-placed weapon caches. In Halo 4, the maximum reserve ammo is significantly reduced, and UNSC weapon caches aren't as common. A defense I've heard for this is that Halo's gameplay is more about juggling weapons and finding the most effective one for the situation at hand, instead of finding your favorite and holding on to it like it's your firstborn. Now, since I come from Call of Duty, I like to pick one or two weapons that I enjoy using and stick with them as long as possible only switching them out when the game presents me with a conveniently placed power weapon that I'm sure I'll need in about 25 seconds. I get that this isn't what Halo is about, but at the same time, playing the game with the Famine Skull on at all times isn't very enjoyable either. If I had to guess, the lower than average ammo count was likely done to promote use of the new Promethean weapons, which leads me to my next problem. While they have interesting designs, the Promethean weapons just aren't fun to use. These weapons aren't special and don't really bring anything unique to the table, especially when compared to their Halo 5 counterparts that actually do change things up a little bit. In that game, many Promethean weapons have tracking abilities inside of Red Reticle range. The suppressor's fire rate speeds up under continuous fire, the scattershot's projectiles bounce and home in on close targets, the list goes on. The only Promethean weapon in this game that does something a little bit special is the Bolt Shot, which can be used either as a weaker Magnum or as a close range shotgun. As for the Prometheans themselves, all of them are kind of problematic. The crawlers are the least annoying of them to fight as they're basically just grunts that can run on walls and don't have many ranks. But the real problems come in with the introduction of the Promethean Knights and the Watchers. Knights can teleport away from the player, go into a frenzy and slash you in close quarters, or if you're really unlucky, one-shot you with an incineration cannon, even on lower difficulties. As for the Watchers, they are just the worst. They fly around and annoy you from a distance, shield their allies, and can even resurrect the mid-firefight. You don't know true pain until you've been cyberbullied by a pack of Watchers and have nothing but a bolt shot. Despite the amount of time clearly put into these enemies, they just are not fun to fight. Fighting an enemy only for it to teleport away for a couple of seconds is just annoying, and getting one shot by a teleporting knight has the potential to instill a white-hot fury in the player. The linearity of the levels. This is something I don't have an inherent problem with. As you may know, I absolutely loved Extinction from Ghosts, and that's one of the most linear game modes ever made. But Halo, especially Combat Evolved, was known for its wide open level design with multiple ways of approach. Every single level in Halo 4 feels like it's guiding you down a set path like a Call of Duty campaign, which is admittedly what every single player campaign is at the end of the day, but it's never felt this apparent in Halo until now. This is something that only gets worse with Halo 5, by the way. Now that we've covered the gameplay issues, let's move on to the issues I have with the narrative and the way the story is told. Because despite the campaign's numerous strengths, I feel like it does falter in a couple areas. Starting with Minute 1, the intro cutscene, while well made, serves no real narrative purpose. It feels like it's only there to ease the audience into the quote unquote 343 take on the universe. A calm before the storm, if you will. 
Puns may be the lowest form of comedy, but they will never stop amusing me. Everything in this prologue looks different, and the music is much different than what we're used to. Additionally, this is the only time Halsey appears in the main game, and the Oni interrogator, to my knowledge, never comes back into the plot. It's not all bad, though. Despite it feeling out of place in the overall narrative, it does introduce us to the ideas that Spartans are broken people, AIs are essentially their security blankets to keep them efficient, and that the campaign is going to be a bit more nuanced than the others. I think this would have worked better as maybe a hype trailer slash recap, like the Origins recap did before the launch of Revelations. But then again, if you did that, you'd have the problem of not everyone seeing it since it's online promotion and not in-game, thus alienating some players. What a pickle. The underutilization of the Didact. This is a weird one because I actually really like this character, but only when he's present in the story, which sadly isn't very often. The build-up to his reveal in Act 1 is really well done, and the scene where he's actually awakened is awesome. Time was your ally, human. But now it has abandoned you. The foreigners have returned. Oh, fuck yeah! But then he just floats around in a ball for the entirety of Act 2, while people talk about how cool of a villain he is, and then finally becomes a real, genuine threat halfway through the third act, only to be killed in a quick time event by a grenade that has trouble killing a crawler in normal gameplay. Fantastic. His design is great, his voice sounds very cool, and his dialogue has just enough cheesy theatrics to be great. But like I said, he just feels underutilized. The pacing and focus of the second half of the game feels... off. It's really hard to describe, but it just lacks the laser focus of the first half. Luckily, Chief and Cortana's relationship retains strong focus, but everything around them seems to move at breakneck speed. Because of this, some story and universe elements seem underdeveloped, especially the Spartan 4s. There's such a nothing element that you could have replaced all of them, including Palmer, with generic UNSC Marines, and you wouldn't have noticed a difference in story or gameplay. Now of course, they get much more focus in Spartan Ops, but in the main campaign, they're a potentially interesting thread that gets completely glossed over. Now, would I have wanted them to split the game in half a la Halo 2, just to learn more about them? Lord no. But I just wish there was something for them to do. Have one of them do something important, or contribute to the plot in some minor way. Just anything besides being a background prop. But worse than underdeveloping the Didact or the Spartan 4s is the Librarian scene. This is the scene where the narrative takes a nosedive and becomes a Jason Blundell-esque exposition dump. The game stops dead in its tracks for 5 minutes just to explain a bunch of nonsense, and the only thing that really comes of it is Chief's inoculation to the composer. Now, if you didn't view any of the game's terminals or read the books, it's even more confusing. You'll be left with questions like, who is the librarian? Who is she to the didact? If she's dead, then how is she talking to and interacting with us? How does the didact and his boy band enter this limbo? Why wasn't the backstory just a terminal? Did they really need to kill the momentum of the story just to tell us the Prometheans are human? The thing I find the most egregious, though, is the reveal that the reason the humans ended up going down a path that led them to developing Spartans was all because of the Librarian's planning. I've always hated reveals like this. You know the ones, where there's a pre-established lore, but then a new character comes in and says, Huh, I was actually the one behind everything. Ha, got him! This scene really reminds me of the Warden's plan in Blood of the Dead. Both scenes stop their narrative and gameplay flow dead, just to exposition dump the audience. And in both cases, they are relatively useless diversions. The epilogue is, like the game's intro, completely unnecessary. But more importantly, it's confusing to casual viewers. How do I know? Because I was one of those confused casuals. Of course, it's no longer confusing to me now, but back then I had a ton of questions. Didn't we just kill the didact? If so, when is this voiceover taking place? Why is this even here? The only thing this outro really does is give us a nice bit of visual symbolism with the removal of Chief's armor reflecting his awakened humanity. Honestly, and I know Racevic has said this already, I, I can't help it if we both have pretty much the same thoughts on the game, but I think the game would have been much better suited if it ended with Chief staring off at Earth. It would have been a dour note to end on, but it would have left such a big impact instead of just having this generic voiceover that serves no purpose. The soundtrack. 
I know this was likely part of 343's original studio goal to differentiate themselves from Bungie, but I feel like this game's score lacks the magic that Marty O'Donnell brought to the original games. The moment this is most apparent is during the intro to the mission Composer, where upon seeing Installation 03, the classic Halo theme plays momentarily. It's not to say the soundtrack is completely worthless though. Lord no, there are some great tracks in here, but most of them just don't feel very Halo-y. And last but not least, the art style change. Now, I'm not gonna turn this into another 343 bad, Bungie good rant. In fact, I actually prefer some of 343's designs to Bungie's. But the change in art style makes it really hard to see this entry as part of the larger Halo mythology, and more importantly, as a direct sequel to Halo 3. From minute one, something feels off. You look at these elites and think, okay, they resemble the elites from the other games, but they're much less elegant and nimble than Bungie's. There's also the problem of Halsey's Spartans not using the canonically accurate armor. I know that the visual appearance of the Spartans in this cutscene is non-canon, and they just didn't have a CG suit ready in time. But a lot of viewers probably don't know that. After that cutscene, we cut back to the forward onto Dawn drifting in space, and that too uses a different model than it did in Halo 3. It's no longer this tiny little piece of a ship floating in space. It's this massive freighter the size of the Pillar of Autumn. And Cortana, she looks different too. While I prefer this game's design to previous entries, I can't deny the continuity flubs. Despite aging four years between games, she looks much younger than she did in Halo 3. But then again, there was very little visual continuity with this character in the first place. So I guess that one can be forgiven. And finally, we come to the Master Chief. Despite being in cryosleep since Halo 3 and not doing anything, he looks nothing like he used to. What I'm trying to get at here is that while these changes may have been acceptable to some players, I can completely understand the immediate disconnect that comes with changing the art style. This point is a bit more nitpicky, but some of the returning weapons lose their recognizable profile from previous entries. For example, the UNSC shotgun. In the Bungie games, the back sight was flipped up and gave the weapon a unique silhouette. But in Halo 4 and 5, the shotgun's backside is flipped down, which results in it losing a bit of that unique character it used to have. Now, its profile looks like that of any other generic FPS shotgun. The Magnum also loses some of its charm. It lacks the tritium sights from previous games, and because of this, it suffers the same fate as the shotgun, where it looks a lot less unique than it used to. Now we come to what might be my favorite part of these videos, the nitpicks. The things that aren't really genuine complaints, but I feel like pointing them out anyway because I'm a bit of a nitpicky goof. After coming out of a sprint, the foley sound used on certain weapons is way too excessive. For example, the bolt shot. This is the sound you use for swapping weapons, not raising it slightly. Honestly, I found it really distracting, as I sprint quite a lot in the Halo campaigns that have it. During the IGC where Chief destroys the gravity well, his right elbow joint has no animation data and it looks really awkward. The shield recharge sound is different, but the caution sound is the same from the original games. At least in Halo 5, both sounds were different. In Halo 4, it's just distracting. The materials on the liches look very odd, like they don't have actual textures and instead just use 2x2 two two maps. It's been 7 years, and I still don't know how I feel about the hexagonal pattern on Chief's visor. The lighting in this IGC is still bugged on MCC. The transition from gameplay to IGC in the final mission. In game, you have the intense music, and you're likely sprinting towards the objective, but immediately after in the cutscene, Chief's just casually walking towards it. With how strong the direction and pacing is in the rest of the game, this moment sticks out like a woefully sore thumb. So, overall, Halo 4 tells a committed, personal, and soulful story that rises above most of its narrative issues due to franchise-high performances, well-written protagonists, and hard-hitting themes. Like we've discussed though, it's not without its flaws. The actual gameplay, while admittedly intense at times, is the weakest in the franchise due to downgraded AI, underdeveloped Prometheans, and the most linear levels of the franchise. Okay, second most linear. Certain narrative elements feel underdeveloped due to a focus on multimedia storytelling, the librarian scene comes out of nowhere and threatens to collapse the narrative completely, and lastly, while this topic has been beaten into the ground over the years, the drastic art style and design changes are hard to get over, especially given that this is a mainline series entry and not a side entry or prequel like Reach. But despite its problems, I have massive respect for this game's campaign. It tried something different, but more importantly, it was confident in its vision. 
So many times you'll see a project that had potential, but the creators were too scared of how it was going to be received, so its original vision was dumbed down. The last half of Infinite Warfare Zombies, everything made by Jason Blundell after Shadows of Evil, Halo 5, the list goes on. Well, that's all for today. This is my first time covering a campaign, so there's likely some growing pains in terms of flow and editing that I can hopefully iron out in the future. I read all the comments, so if you have any suggestions or spotted some error that I may have missed, let me know. I'm always looking to better my content in any way, big, small, what have you. If you did enjoy this and would like to see more Halo stuff, again, let me know. I really like this franchise, so I might just have to do more in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching and have a great day.